And uh, well, uh, thank you to Enzo and, and all for organizers for convening this meeting. Uh, it looks like a great lineup, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing the, the talks this week. And thanks especially to, to Christian for inviting me. Thank you, Christian. Um, so I'd, I'd like to present, a, so moving to computational chemistry now, a, a, a computational study of knot formation in clusters. And I think the topic of clusters makes this uh, a unique talk this week. I don't think anybody else is talking about clusters. Um, but the, the particles in the cluster are not uh, permanently bonded to each other. So this uh, example falls into the category of cases where the, uh, the, the, the chain through space, the curve through space that hosts the knot has to form at the same time as the topology itself, um, unlike in a polymeric molecule where one already has a chain. And the uh, techniques that we're using to study these clusters are drawn from energy landscape theory. And uh, I think some of the terminology of energy landscapes uh, is commonly used to uh, understand various phenomena in, in chemistry and physics and related fields. Um, but I think relatively few people are using the detailed um, uh, tools of the, uh, the theory as their primary source of attack on a problem. So, um, I'll take a somewhat didactic approach in the hope of explaining how energy landscape theory can be used to tackle some things that will be otherwise very difficult to do for this sort of system. Um, and they're more generally applicable methods, so um, it's not just confined to this particular topic. Um, I've given my talk a little subtitle, um, which you can take as my uh, uh, content slide. I'll be telling you about the structures that we uh, observe, but also the pathway for their formation and the methods used to uh, study them. Here are my collaborators uh, on this project. Uh, chief amongst them is David Wales. Um, David, uh, back in the day, was my PhD supervisor, uh, but we've continued collaborating from time to time on projects like this one. Um, special credit goes to James Farrell because he produced uh, some of the graphics that I'll be using in this talk. So this all started when I was thinking about um, Dipolar fluids, fluids of dipolar particles, in particular the phase diagram of dipolar particles, which is still a controversial topic, um, and also gels that form from branch networks of dipolar particles. Um, so rather, rather difficult things to deal with, but um, I, I grew up studying clusters, and one of the motivations for studying clusters is that by understanding how a small group of particles interact and how they behave, um, you can start up understanding a bit more about bulk phases, which generally uh, involve many more particles and can be harder to deal with. So uh, I want to decide to look at um, clusters of dipolar particles as well. And for my potential, I took uh, this thing here, the Stockmayer potential, which is probably one of the simplest models um, with attraction, isotropic attraction that you can have of dipolar particles. It consists of a Leonard-Jones part, standard Leonard-Jones potential, which is isotropic and encourages the formation of compact, highly coordinated structures, often with uh, icosahedral symmetry. And added to that is this uh, term, which is the interaction between two point dipoles. And dipoles, as we know, like to form chains head to tail. And those two things are not very compatible. Um, so this anisotropic potential, uh, the, the strength of that is controlled by the scalar parameter mu. When mu is zero, we just have a plain Leonard-Jones potential. And increasing mu causes this term to dominate. So each particle has five degrees of freedom, three translational and two orientational. And... Um, as I say, it's probably this, this potential, I think, was introduced as a model of dipolar molecules. However, like many simple potentials, it's maybe uh, becoming important again um, in a different context, in the context of colloidal materials. This is a snapshot of um, some colloidal particles that are interacting by magnetic dipoles. And the, the formula for interaction of magnetic dipoles is just the same as, as electric dipoles. Um, they like to form chains. Um, but one of the nice things about working with colloids is that you can control the interactions between the particles much more finely than you can with molecules uh, without um, changing the molecule. Um, for example, by, uh, in, in, for, for, for colloids, you can um, have 
controllable strength and range of attraction using um, depletion effects, um, the size and, and uh, concentration of a polymer, or the solvent quality, or by grafting polymers onto the surface of the, the colloids themselves. And last week I was at a meeting in Utrecht, uh, sorry, in, in um, Vienna on uh, structure formation in soft colloids, uh, where I spoke to Albert Philipser, who's from Utrecht. Um, Albert is a, a very distinguished colloid experimentalist, and he said that actually it shouldn't be too hard to create colloidal particles that have something reasonably closely um, approaching this sort of potential uh, by, by using grafted polymers. And he pointed out that actually uh, the experimentalists spend quite a lot of time trying to suppress the isotropic attraction in their colloids, um, whereas the predictions of this work are actually that that's essential for some of the interesting effects. Um, now, for normal Leonard Jones systems, uh, we normally work in, in uh, reduced units where the well depth, the pair well depth is the unit of energy. The, the dipolar term here modifies that well depth uh, considerably, so I'll be using throughout a thing I'm going to call uh, epsilon star, which is the, the modified pair well depth in the most favorable configuration head to tail. Okay, so we've got a cluster of these Stockmayr particles. The first question to ask is what structures do they like to form? And uh, generally, that question is referring to the lowest energy structure. So uh, we need to globally optimize this rather frustrated uh, system, which is trying to do two things at once. Um, so for a cluster of n particles, which I will denote like this, st subscript n, there are five n degrees of freedom, so we have a very high dimensional function, and in general, the number of metastable states on a potential energy surface increases uh, literally exponentially with the number of particles. So this rapidly becomes astronomical. And finding the lowest energy structure is a difficult problem. A common approach to that is simulated annealing, generally uh, uh, slowly cooling down a system. So if you have a sort of cartoon energy landscape like this, you hope that by cooling it gradually, it'll find its way to the lowest energy structure. But if the landscape looks a bit like this, of course, one could end up there, uh, and then things the system would be too cold to overcome the barrier to the correct structure. And we can anticipate that this is going to be the situation in the system I've just described because of the competing effects. So simulated annealing is very likely to fail. And so a big step forward was made in, in global optimization uh, with uh, the introduction of the basin hopping algorithm by David Wales now nearly 20 years ago. And the idea is quite simple. Um, it's a bit like doing an ordinary Monte Carlo simulation where a small random perturbation is made to a structure and then the change in energy that that causes is compared to a thermal energy uh, to decide whether to accept or reject the step. The only difference in basin hopping is to insert an additional step, which is a local minimization. And it's the locally minimized uh, energies that are compared when deciding whether to accept or reject a step. And this has the effect of transforming the potential energy surface into a set of plateaus, because all points within the basin of attraction of a given minimum will be mapped onto the energy of that minimum. And so this has the obvious advantage of removing the local barriers between adjacent minima, which should help. But it still doesn't explain how you'd cope with a surface like this, because if you want to get there from here, you still have to overcome a barrier. And um, so although this isn't often covered, I think it's useful to understand why basin hopping really is successful. And we can do that using um, a test case, the, the case of um, a 38 atom cluster of just pure Leonard Jones particles. Um, we'll come back to this uh, in the Stockmayr case to see what happens when we add the dipoles. But it turns out that for this particular cluster, the uh, lowest energy structure is a chunk of face-centered cubic lattice. It looks like this. But there are a vast number of competing low energy structures which are um, packed in an icosahedral sort of motif. And so the potential energy surface is rather like this. There are different parts of it um, with, uh, w w which can't be reached very easily from each other. Um, so one reason why basin hopping works is uh, it requires us to take a higher dimensional view. If we go now to a two-dimensional cartoon, if we imagine trying to get from one minimum to another, typically uh, we'd expect that to go via the saddle point here. But by uh, mapping all points within the basin of attraction onto a plateau, like uh, this, hopefully, yes, can't see the colors from here. 
Um, all points within that basin have the same energy, same here. That means that the interface between those two basins of attraction is now uh, actually a hyperplane. And in the more general case, the dimensionality of that plane is just one less than the dimensionality of the full space. So this makes uh, moving between minima somewhat easier. But there's also a, um, a thermodynamic reason. If we look at the population of different families of structures as a function of temperature. Um, for the original cluster, at low temperatures, um, the face-centered cubic structures are most probable by definition. They're the, the, the global minimum. As we increase the temperature, icosahedral structures take over, and then disordered liquid-like structures from them. The problem is you can see that there's a, a very narrow region where the liquid-like and the um, FCC structures have a, a significant probability at the same temperature. So as we cool down from high temperature, there's a very small chance we'll actually find ourselves in the right place uh, for global uh, optimization. And that shows up as a sort of solid, solid transition in the heat capacity before the main melting transition. So this is why uh, that's a challenging case, or used to be regarded as a, a challenging case for global optimization. Um, in the transformed surface, we can look at the thermodynamics of the transformed surface. Um, the effect is to broaden these probability peaks so that the, uh, the switch over from FCC to liquid-like has a large region here where both sets of structures have a reasonable probability. And that means that it's possible to find uh, the way to the global minimum much more easily. And, and the, the heat capacity has been broadened into a very, very wide peak uh, without this low temperature transition. So let's take a look at applying that to the um, Stockmere clusters with the dipoles. Um, let's take the uh, case of 13 particles as, uh, as an example. Um, at very low dipole moments, all that happens is that the dipoles have to sort of decorate the Leonard-Jones structure. So if we start off with the icosahedron, uh, and now the, the, the colors here correspond to the direction of the dipoles, um, you can see they just sort of form some loops. The symmetry has been slightly distorted from IH to D3. Um, at the opposite extreme, for a very strong dipole moment, of course, we get a ring. A chain forms, and that chain closes up to get the last pairwise energy back. And in between, we see uh, global minima that are um, sort of intermediate. So here, um, two stacked six-membered rings. This particle in the middle is unhappy with regards to its dipole. doesn't know which way to point. But it gets a lot of Leonard-Jones energy back because it's got a high coordination. Eventually, it pops out to make two uh, staggered rings. And that, that sort of sequence from compact to uh, ring-like is uh, quite characteristic. Here's a, a structural map for the structures that we see um, for clusters up to 55 atoms. 55 is a magic number for the Leonard-Jones system. And this is the strength of the dipole moment. So as expected, uh, for low dipole moment, we see relaxed Leonard-Jones structures. For sufficiently large dipole moments, we see rings. Beneath that, stacked rings the stacked rings are more curved, which is less good for the dipole moment, but the stacking gives us back some of the Leonard-Jones energy. And, uh, but but the, the interesting stuff really happens in between, where neither the isotropic part of the potential nor the highly directional part can dominate over the other. And that's where we start seeing knots and links. And uh, I hadn't anticipated this in advance, um, but, of course, it does make intuitive sense in retrospect because by forming a chain, the dipolar part of the potential is at least partially satisfied. But by raveling that chain up into a compact structure, um, some of the isotropic potential is also satisfied. So it's a highly frustrated system, um, but in the end, it turns out that a knot can be energetically optimal. And here's a gallery of some of the structures that we've seen in that system. Um, Here's an example of the simplest topology, the trefoil knot. Um, so this is coming back to the, the 38 atom cluster. This was the one that had the, 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 the challenging behavior even without the dipoles. Um, that, knot, that cluster can actually form two different kinds of knots. Um, at relatively high dipole moment, it'll form a trefoil because that's, uh, it can do that with quite an open structure where the chain doesn't have to bend too much. 
but at a weaker dipole moment, it'll actually form a more complicated 819 knot. This is more tightly curved, which is less good for the dipole moment, but if the dipole is weaker, then that can be uh, traded off against having a more compact structure, which is favored by the Leonard-Jones potential. And um, you can even see uh, how, how the Leonard-Jones potential gets its way. For example, in this structure, um, the, the color now is changing smoothly along the chain to highlight the chain, but uh, you can see that this particle here is surrounded by a very neat hexagon of particles, which, which is exactly the sort of structure that the Leonard-Jones potential uh, tries to encourage. And uh, here in this cluster, you can see a little tetrahedron, another very strong uh, Leonard-Jones motif. So this, this structure, although it's actually an unknot, is uh, really a set of sort of face-sharing tetrahedra that are twisting round in a wreath. And we also see some linked structures. The, the, the stacked rings are just a, a trivial unlink. Um, but we even see some, some three-member uh, links. So, again, you, you can see how um, simple things like uh, you know, simulated annealing would, would, might struggle with this sort of thing. I should say a word about how we identify the structures. Um, we do so just using the, the Jones polynomial, which was uh, adequate for our uh, level of complexity. Um, it's important to be able to define the chain, though, because remember, these particles are not permanently bonded. Um, so how do we extract a definition of the, ch the chain from it um, unambiguously? Uh, but we're quite strict about this. Um, and it can be done with uh, just one parameter defining nearest neighbors of the particles. If we take a given particle and ask uh, which of its neighbors in its northern hemisphere um, has the most aligned dipole using dot product, um, and take that to be the next particle in the chain and keep going like that, we could define a chain. There's no guarantee that doing that in the reverse direction would reproduce the same chain. In general, some organization of dipole, uh, dipolar particles uh, will not produce a self-consistent uh, chain uh, if you go backwards and forwards. Um, by the time that that does work, that going forwards and backwards produces the same results, actually the chain is very well defined and intuitively is what you would pick out if you looked at it. And that, that, that can be done, um, obviously, in an automated way, uh, unambiguously. So I think it would be important to look at what sort of knots we can form. We've seen some rather complicated ones, up to 10 crossings. Um, certainly, the torus knots are common amongst the ones that we observe. Here's the uh, 819 knot drawn as an idealized torus knot um, with and without the donut. And here's the, uh, uh, one of the clusters that we observe with that topology. And you can see that it's actually adopted the same sort of configuration as the torus rendition of the, uh, the 819 knots, that when it's very clear that the torus is there. This actually has point group C2, uh, a, a real uh, rigorous symmetry to it. And um, as, as, as David has pointed out, this is uh, uh, the same topology as uh, Christian and his student um, Guido uh, Poles uh, have, have observed and, and published last year. Um, from rather different fragments, uh, th these are um, helical fragments which have self-assembled into uh, the same topology. So it's interesting maybe to dwell on which structures are favored and which aren't. Um, out of the torus knots that are out there, we've seen the trefoil, 5-1, 7-1, 8 not the 9-1 for some reason. Um, and they, they also don't appear in the order of uh, complexity. So for example, the 7-1 knot is relatively rare. And we saw that I think the 10 crossing knot before the 19 crossing knot, uh, the, the, the 8 crossing knot. Um, so it is obviously to do with packing. Here's a knot that isn't a torus knot. Um, but it has a, a good stability because it lends itself to a regular um, packing. You can see sort of effectively two interlocking helices here. Um, so that suggests that not all knots are equally uh, designable, and it depends on how the topology lends itself to a, a structural manifestation. Um, we see some links. Uh, we see one of them is a torus link, this three-component link. Um, this looks like it might be a torus link, but in fact it isn't. It's the, the, the Solomon link, and this is actually uh, quite common. We see that one a lot. Um, and this example, again, has a strict C2 symmetry, C2 point group there. I think the Borromean links, although it would be nice to see, um, are probably a bit unlikely because of the um, uh, 
the less compact nature of the way that they would have to form, but um, there are always surprises. So I think we were sort of forced to the conclusion that some topologies are more amenable to symmetric uh, packings than others, and the connection between symmetry and low energy is, is another intriguing one, which, uh, well, maybe we can take up over a beer one evening. Um, so that's the structural side of things. What about um, going beyond that? Uh, what if we want to ask questions like, well, can those low energy structures actually be reached? And are there other competing metastable structures out there that um, are important? And this is where energy landscape um, ideas really come to the fore. Now, I think when most people talk about energy landscapes, what they're really referring to is a free energy landscape. And free energy um, intrinsically involves integrating over some coordinates, effectively to get a partition function, which is parametric in some, uh, uh, some variables, and uh, the logarithm of that is a free energy. And so here, here's a, just, just one example of a free energy landscape taken from my own work with, with uh, Ivan a few years ago, Ivan Kaluza, where we were looking at the um, cooperative folding and binding of a protein. And there we knew that we were interested in how far the protein was from the surface and how many native contacts it had uh, as a measure of how folded it was. And so we knew in advance what to, to look for. And we were able to average over all other coordinates in order to get a two-dimensional uh, free energy landscape with our two order parameters like this, and then the color represents the free energy. Um, so that obviously reduces the dimensionality of the problem, makes it more plottable. But what if you don't know uh, what the relevant structural parameters are? Well, that's one advantage of working with the potential energy landscape rather than the free energy landscape. There we deal with the full, in this case, 5N dimensional uh, surface, which can be characterized by focusing on the stationary points. Um, the most important stationary points are the minima, which are metastable structures. After that, it's the first order saddle points, which are, in, in a chemist's language, the transition states. They're the saddles with exactly one negative Hessian eigenvalue, and they connect the minima. So you could imagine plotting out a potential energy surface as a graph where the uh, minima are the vertices and the uh, saddle points are the edges. Um, this would require building up a database of transition states and minima. Um, so this is a difficult task. Uh, normally the number of such structures is astronomical. We can't hope to get them all. So we need a way of um, focusing on the important ones, which are generally the, the lower energy ones. Once we have that, um, we can try and see how the landscape is organized at a global level. And we can also use the database to generate approximate thermodynamics and dynamics if we have a simple enough model for the density of states at the stationary points. But first of all, how, how in principle would we be able to visualize this very high dimensional object? That can be done using um, disconnectivity graphs. Um, the idea of disconnectivity graphs is to group uh, minima together into sets that can be mutually interconverted by pathways that lie entirely below a certain energy threshold. And I think the lines are a little bit faint on this diagram. Maybe you can just about make them out. But if I've got a sketch potential energy surface that looks like this, and I choose an energy threshold up here, all these minima are mutually accessible by paths that never exceed the, uh, the threshold that I've chosen. And they get represented by a single vertex on this disconnectivity graph. If I choose a, a lower threshold, um, you can see that these minima start getting cut off. This one can't be converted to that one without exceeding my threshold. And so I'll get several vertices at that level, and they're joined by edges to the vertex, the parent vertex from which they came. So if we have a potential energy surface that figuratively looks like this, like a funnel, a set of convergent pathways down to the minimum, then um, the graph, the disconnectivity graph, will come out looking like this, this tree here with short branches coming off at the sides and leading down to the minimum. And uh, an example of a system that behaves like that are simple Leonard Jones clusters with um, <clears throat> complete outer shells that readily find their structure. Um, it's possible that there's a set of convergent pathways to the global minimum, but the barriers are bigger. In this case, the branches will just be longer and, and sort of droop down. Uh, alongside the main stem. A good example of that is the Buckminster fullerene molecule, um, where you can move he uh, hexagons and pentagons around the surface um, by twisting carbon-carbon bonds. 
but that's energetically very expensive. Or you might find yourself with a situation where there are many low-lying minima which are competing energetically, separated by a hierarchy of barriers, and then the disconnectivity graph looks qualitatively different. Um, and an example of a system like that is water clusters. Water clusters have very rough energy landscapes. So the advantage of this is you can always draw it in two dimensions. This only works for a single uh, variable. Um, so we need to, to, to be able to plot these graphs, we need to build up a database of minima and transition states, um, which is a difficult uh, job. So uh, I'll explain how we do that. Um, again, these techniques are applicable uh, to lots of other systems, not just knotted clusters. Um, now, although this is a technical point, it turns out to be absolutely crucial. It held us up for a long time. Um, having an appropriate coordinate system, uh, you might think that for uh, a, a dipolar molecule, um, cylindrical uh, sort of spherical polars would be ideal, just the right number of uh, variables. Um, but there are the usual problems with spherical polars, the redundancy of phi when theta is naught or two or pi, and the fact that theta really shouldn't go beyond pi. And the breakthrough here was made by Dwipayan Chakrabarti, one of the co-authors on our uh, paper on the knots, who um, worked out a general way of doing this using an angle axis framework. Um, so you can describe the orientation of any rigid body to make, taking a reference uh, orientation and then defining a, a rotation axis with a vector and uh, using the magnitude of the vector to tell you what angle, to, uh, how, how, how large the angle of rotation should be. And although this introduces an additional redundant variable, it turns out that you can uh, calculate the uh, zero eigenvalue modes analytically and project them out during optimizations. Um, furthermore, you can deal with all the sort of nasty derivatives from the coordinate system separately and uh, use this for any rigid body with site-site interactions, even if they're anisotropic sites like the dipole. So um, that, that was a, a really important um, uh, and, and very general breakthrough. To build up the database, um, remember where we are, we were starting off with maybe just a few um, very different structures that we found from the global optimization technique, some, some low-lying structures. We need to connect them up. They may be very far apart in configuration space. And we do this using um, a family of methods called nudged elastic band methods. The idea is um, to take the, the two points in configuration space, now on the sort of two dimensions of the board, and draw, first of all, a straight line between them. So you've got to imagine that this is a high dimensional space. All the particles are just going to move in straight lines between where they were and where they should be in the two structures. This obviously involves some very high energies. Um, so we place a, a set of replicas of the system. Each one is a copy of the entire system. Uh, these sort of, uh, regular points along this path smoothly interpolating and connect these replicas by artificial springs. And then uh, we allow the springs to relax on the energy landscape, going downhill uh, towards minima and transition states. You've got to imagine some complex set of contours on this plot. And uh, the springs help to stop the replicas all just piling into the nearest minimum at the bottom and give us an approximate pathway um, between these two very distant minima that is forced to go over at least some of the saddle points. Now, it won't go neatly through the exact path, um, but it gives us a starting point. So uh, it should go close to a sequence of minima and transition states that connect the structures we're interested in. But this will be only approximate. And this idea of nudging is uh, the, the, the elastic band business. You have to be quite careful about which components of the force you allow uh, to, to, to take effect. So the next thing to do is to tighten up the transition states. Um, if we're passing by a nearer transition state, we need to uh, locally optimize that. Um, this can, we need to walk uphill in exactly one direction, a soft mode, and downhill in all other directions. Um, this can be done without explicit calculation of the Hessian uh, using hybrid methods. And uh, from there, there will be exactly one unstable mode which we can follow downhill to the two connecting minima. Now, having moved slightly from our original path, um, we might find that actually the connected minima are not the ones we expected. That's okay. We're building up a database of stationary points. We just need to reconnect these structures by reapplying the elastic band methods. And because the gap is getting smaller and smaller, um, this eventually does converge. Okay, so we end up with at least one path that connects two different structures. 
it's important, given the very large number of structures out there, that we have relevant uh, minima and transition states, which are generally going to be the low-lying ones. Um, those are the ones that are going to dominate both kinetically and thermodynamically. So we need to augment the database um, by trying to uh, bias a search towards low-lying structures. And this can be done with uh, another general method called discrete path sampling, which is the sort of energy landscape equivalent of a method that uh, you might be more familiar with, um, which is the, the uh, dynamic path sampling method of David Chandler. Uh, David Chandler's method involves shooting uh, a trajectory from one structure to another, perturbing it slightly, and then uh, exploring the ensemble of trajectories. Well, the, the discrete path, the, the energy landscape equivalent of that, is to take a sequence of minima and transition states that connect an initial structure with a final structure and try to find um, pathways that are as fast as possible. And uh, this can be done, first of all, by trying to assess the flux uh, between two states by placing the intervening states in the steady state. And it turns out the, the, the equations can be solved for that if you have at least an approximate formula for um, overcoming a single barrier. So we use a stripped back version of transition state theory, uh, which just involves the exponential of the barrier height and the ratio of the orders of the point groups of the transition state and the minimum. Um, that's very important, uh, very important. It can, can be a big factor in the flux. And we assume that the dynamics are Markovian in the sense that um, the system spends long enough in any one minimum that it can forget where it was before deciding where to go next. So using that, we can uh, compare different pathways. Um, for example, we can try and uh, reduce the barriers between uh, where, where, where the barrier is high by uh, trying to find lower transition states by doing localized searches. We can also try and shortcut the pathway by finding a single connection that uh, bypasses a two-step connection or, or greater. And by biasing the system towards uh, paths with high rates, we can build up a database of relevant structures. So here's an example. Um, what I'm going to show you is the evolution of the potential energy landscape with increasing dipole moment for the, the 13 atom cluster. So starting off with the case where the dipole moment is zero, which is just the pure Leonard Jones case, we see a sort of classic funnel-shaped energy landscape, which uh, has these branches, short branches coming off the side and leading down to the global minimum. This structure uh, readily relaxes. If we just turn on the dipole slightly, um, all that happens is that each of these local minima has to be decorated with a set of dipoles. In some cases, that can be done in more than one way. So what we see is a slight fraying of the ends of the branches, but basically the same graph. Nothing has happened. Here is a bit further on when the dipole moment has been increased. This is close to a, ch a sort of crossover point between a global minima. This is where the, uh, this structure, the centered hexagonal antiprism, has taken over from the... Uh, um, icosahedron. And although those look like quite different structures, you can see that the barrier between them on the shortest path is not very, uh, not very high in comparison to the, the pairwise energy. And uh, in fact, it can be done in one step. There's just one transition state that connects these structures. And the, the path is illustrated here. If we start off with the rings, um, you can think of the ring structure as a set of um, sort of edge sharing triangles. Uh, like this. If I twist the two halves of the structure with respect to each other, they can clasp to make the icosahedron. On the right-hand side, we can see what's happening to the dipoles. Initially, we have two rings, closed rings of dipoles. Um, those in the process of rearranging connect up into a single open-ended chain, but those split up again into three loops to make the icosahedron. And here's the energy profile for that uh, rearrangement. Um, the coordinate here is the uh, integrated path length along the uh, very sort of curved path through um, the Euclidean space of the centers of mass of the particles, not including the orientational coordinates. So you can see there is indeed one transition state, a bit of a shoulder here, um, but there's only one true barrier. Um, so that's a surprisingly sort of cooperative uh, conversion of two quite different structures. And um, further along, increasing the dipole moment further, you can begin to see how the energy landscape can have different regions of configuration space uh, with the 
different structures. At, at some point, each of these will be the global minimum, but they exist on the energy landscape as metastable states, even when they're not the lowest structure. And you can see that they, they're clustered together in regions um, connected by relatively large barriers. Right? But each one will have a set of defective structures which resembles it more closely. Um, so you can sort of imagine this tree evolving as we twist the one parameter that we've got, the, um, the, the, the dipole moment strength. And uh, as, as the landscape evolves, um, minima may appear and disappear via catastrophes in the, uh, the surface. In the meantime, the uh, metastable structures can be traced. In the process of doing this, we find a set of um, characteristic rearrangement mechanisms which are common. Um, they're concerted even when they're quite local. Um, for example, this diamond square diamond uh, rearrangement where uh, you have to imagine four particles at the vertices, uh, the diamond sort of squishes into a square and then squishes out the other way. This is actually a very common rearrangement mechanism in all sorts of other molecular clusters. Um, for example, boranes and carboranes. Um, but in this context, they have an additional importance because they allow the network, the, the topology, to be rewired. Um, the, the cyan lines here show uh, ch aligned chains. Um, you have to imagine the rest of the structure continuing uh, like this and like this. Um, what this rearrangement has done is to connect what were previously uh, the particles on the long diagonal of the, diag uh, of the, of the um, diamond. Similarly, oh, by the way, and that, that, that mechanism is the one at the heart of the rearrangements that I showed you uh, in the previous uh, example, the, the icosahedron. Um, the twisting involves changing diamonds into squares and back to diamonds. Here's another common mechanism, a butterfly that can sort of uh, fold up into a tetrahedron, again, rewiring the topology from these edges to those edges. And it's also possible for um, particles to be exchanged between rings in a sort of concerted budding mechanism, this particle is going to be transferred into the yellow ring. Those all occur uh, frequently. And here's an example of it. Here's the uh, energy landscape for the formation of a knot. Uh, this is the smallest cluster that uh, exhibits a knot, the 21 particle cluster. Here's a trefoil, and I've, I've chosen a dipole moment where it's uh, competing very closely with the stacked rings, the sort of unlink um, structure. And you can see very clearly here the two regions of configuration space. We've got a double funnel energy landscape explicitly shown here. Um, and uh, again, you know, you can see why simulated annealing would really run aground with this sort of system. And the pathway between these two structures is uh, multiple step. Um, here are some snapshots along the way. So starting from the stacked rings, the unlink, the first thing that happens is they join up to make uh, an unknot. That then rearranges to make a hopf link. Particles are exchanged and it reconfigures. And finally, we get the trefoil. And here's an animation of that process along the minimum energy path that we found. Um, sorry about the change in color scheme. When there are two colors, there are two components. When the color changes smoothly, it's one component. Here we go. So first of all, the unlink, unknot, hopf link exchange of particles, a bit of reconfiguration, get everything lined up, and finally, the trefoil. And here it is again with the particles shown uh, in a slightly more space-filling way, so you can see the dipoles moving around. Unknot, unlink, uh, sorry, a hop link, exchange of particles, around. and the trefoil. And uh, so I, I think, I'd, well, first of all, here's the energy profile for that reaction. It's quite bumpy. Again, the reaction coordinate is this sort of integrated path length uh, along the, uh, the very sort of curve, curvilinear path through configuration space. Um, it looks a little bit bumpy. I think that's partly because I haven't included the orientational degrees of freedom in the definition of the path length. Um, and I think it's fair to say that probably you know, even, even advanced techniques like transition path sampling would really struggle with a, a rough path like this. And I have to emphasize, we did not know the reaction coordinate in advance. Right? We didn't have to know what to plot here. The energy landscape method bypasses that whole problem. Okay, 
That was Leonard Jones plus point dipole. Of course, you can go to higher um, multipoles. You can do um, Leonard Jones plus quadrupole. Uh, there are various ways to draw a quadrupole, um, but they all like to form two-dimensional sheets. So now instead of a competition between compact structures and linear structures, we have a competition between compact structure, three-dimensional structures, if you like, and two-dimensional structures. So of course we don't see knots, but we do see some other exotic structures with some really weird point groups like S6 as a, as a point group. That's pretty rare. Um, and also, uh, you know, the equivalent of closing up a chain in the two-dimensional system is to close up uh, a sheet, either into a tube or into a ball. And then other topological questions become interesting uh, because, of course, you can't tile a sphere just with squares. There have to be topological defects. So a different kind of topological consideration comes into play there. Let's mention a couple of other projects that are underway in Durham. Um, we are lucky enough to have a Leverhulme uh, trust funded program grant on knots. So there are a lot of people thinking about knots in Durham. Um, I joined this as a sort of imposter from outside after arriving in Durham. Um, but with, uh, well, I'm working with Chris Pryor in the maths department um, who uses, uh, well, he, he's, he's developing methods to extract um, information on protein structure from um, X-ray crystallography and is using prote uh, knot fingerprints as one uh, ingredient for doing that. And then with um, a biophysicist and a mathematician, um, I'm also looking at bonding networks where it's possible to have uh, vertices that are connected by more than just two edges. So you can't use the ordinary sort of Jones polynomial and so on, but there is a whole uh, sort of reasonably well-developed mathematics of topological invariance for graphs as well. And so we're exploring that in the context of chemical bonds. Um, one thing, so unfortunately neither of those projects is sufficiently advanced to talk about uh, here, but I hope uh, at some point in the future I'll have the chance to present those. One thing we have managed to get out is a, a tutorial review on uh, the application of knot theory to, to chemistry, and it's just come out in chemical society reviews. Um, we've taken a rather different cross-section of knot-related topics from the, the reviews that are already out there. So... Um, and if you have new students starting in this area, um, they might find it a useful introduction. We were restricted to 50 references, uh, which makes life pretty difficult. Um, but actually, a very large number of people in this audience are, are mentioned uh, in, in, in this uh, short review. Um, so just quickly to summarize, um, I've shown you a system where, perhaps surprisingly, uh, a knot can be the energetically optimal uh, state of a cluster. And this arises from a uh, compromise between competing effects. And uh, the, 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 the chain that forms, the, the, that hosts the knot, has to form at the same time as the topology itself. We see some pretty complex knots. Um, the torus knots prevail and other high symmetry structures. But there's a great variety of knots out there, as, as David was alluding to, that. Um, no, we don't see. We've only got one parameter to tune here, so we're doing pretty well by tuning just the dipole moment strength. We see a great variety of topological structures. Um, but uh, I think it's a very interesting question which knots are designable and which are not. Um, and maybe I think Ivan might tell us a bit more about this afternoon. Um, we've taken a global view of the energy landscape using uh, a toolbox that we had to develop uh, for the purpose. And we've identified some elemental rearrangement mechanisms. Um, and I suppose the whole thing is only possible because of the directionality of the interactions. You can think of a, a dipolar particle as a sphere that has two patches, a, a plus patch and a minus patch. Um, but it just goes sh to show um, the, the, the complexity of structures that can emerge from um, anisotropic interactions of that sort. And again, I'll sort of point towards Ivan's work, I think Ivan will be telling us a bit about patchy particles and knot formation later in the day. Uh, but that's it from me. I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.